too late Now family, we the ones who gotta delegate Get that money in the power, never be fake Stick to co-sign for three, what did he say? Uh, create jobs, support our own Educate the same and buy back your home Got three degrees, triple ten Three PhDs, now we on the CNN DBTV, let's talk about negligence Ignorance is bliss, but we can turn it to intelligence Believe none of what you hear, half of what you see Let's break it down here on Dr. Boyce TV Here we are You know, uh, it, it seems to me that You know, if you think about an abusive relationship Where you have somebody who loves some loves another person is looking for their acceptance, looking for their approval, looking for, for their affection, looking for their validation, and the other person just keeps peeing on them. Like they keep doing an R. Kelly and peeing on them and disrespecting them in every way that they can possibly think of and sending every signal that they possibly can that they don't love you, but yet you still hold out hope. You still hold out hope. And maybe you hold out hope because your self esteem so low you don't think you can do better by yourself. Uh, maybe you hold out hope because maybe at one point they were nice to you and you want them, you think they're going to be nice again if given the right circumstances. Maybe you hold out hope because you keep thinking that it was your fault that he, you know, well, he had to beat me. He, he only beat me because I didn't cook. I didn't bake the cookies right. But next time I'm going to bake them cookies just right. And he won't have no reason to beat me up. You know, and, and, and I think that, you know, a lot of times we hold out hope for uh, white supremacy in the exact same sort of way. Like we really have this weird hope, this weird fantasy that they're going to just figure it out and say, gosh, we really did you black people wrong. And, and, and all they need is for us to just love them enough to love them back into righteous behavior. You know, like, like pe people really think they can love you out of your drug addiction, love you out of your abusiveness, love you out of your, uh, love you out of your, your ridiculous behavior. And, uh, and, and, and so I said, you know, I said, I, I said, go down the list of all the signs of an abusive relationship and let me know if you think that that applies to our relationship with white people. Cause we really love us some white folks. Like we really are the ultimate white supremacists. And, uh, and now why do I bring that up to start the conversation? Well, because, um, I was watching this, uh, documentary on PBS, Henry Louis Gates, uh, from Harvard was doing the documentary. Now Gates, you know, I, I'm not, I don't think he's all bad. I really don't. Um, I, I, I've watched him for for a long time. I talked to Cornell West about him for a long time. Me and Cornell were in the car for, we literally we were together for seven hours that day in New York City uh, for an event that we had in Brooklyn a few years ago. And and I asked him, I said, so tell me, what, what is your take on Gates? Like, tell me, you know, and, and, and we talked, we had some private conversations about it that gave me insights. I try to, I try to find out facts. I try to understand as opposed to just speculate. And, uh, and so my, you know, my conclusion on Gates is that um, Gates is a guy who, uh, you know, has a type of achievement that many of us as black people aspire to. You know, a lot of things that we aim for uh, in terms of assimilation and acceptance, he's achieved those things. And as a result of, you know, his achievement of high levels of assimilation and acceptance, I mean, you don't get much stronger than, you know, in, in, in the assimilation pile than uh, when the white folks at Harvard decide that they like you and they want you, you know, on their faculty, right? So that's pretty cool. Good for him. You know, I'm not going to understate that. You know, I'm a scholar too, and, and, and I think that that's really great for him. Um, but I think that you have to really stop for a minute from a strategic standpoint as black people and really ask yourself, is that really working for us as black folks? And, you know, is that really what I mean, this 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 idea, this fascination with assimilation and symbolism, uh, the celebration of black people on TV, is that really empowering the community or is that giving you a bunch of feel good moments that somehow allow you to continue to hold out hope for white people that one day they're going to create enough jobs and opportunities for all of us? Or, you know, or maybe it becomes like the Hunger Games In the Hunger Games. It was a fascinating story where basically they would oppress the masses, but they would pick a couple of people out of the group every year and elevate them to the highest levels of society, treat them better than, than the elites got treated. And they would parade these individuals to the masses in order to control the masses. And they would convince the masses, like, look, if you play the game, if you commit yourself, sorry, let me see, you know, my nose, I, well, y'all told me I have something in my nose, so let me make sure, am I good? Okay, I think I'm good, all right. Um, the, uh, you know, I gotta, you, you gotta fix stuff like that, you can't be sitting here with a booger hanging out your nose, man, that's just tacky as hell. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, so so the, the masses 
would be controlled by the parading of the symbolic success stories, right? And that's what would keep everybody sort of in 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 the game, right? And uh, and, and and so so I'm going to make a couple arguments here to kind of break this down and tell you what I saw with this documentary and some of the things that really got me going and got me thinking if you could do me a favor real quick please hit the thumbs up button hit the share button hit the subscribe button please hit the thumbs up button uh, also uh, I'll let you guys know um, uh, the the uh, oh the May 6 May 6 is when the investing masterclass begins so if you still like to join you can still jump in you can go to um, you can go to dr. Boyce masterclass.com that's dr. Boyce masterclass.com if you'd like to join us in the masterclass dr. Boyce masterclass.com somebody type that in so so here, here's one thing I want to start off with I think that as black people one area where you've been lied to is that you've been falsely led to believe that acceptance by others is your key to freedom you know you've been taught to believe that if you um, get the right education at the right school get the right job or if white people put you on TV that that will make you successful and that will make you free right you know it, because I, I watched this Gates documentary and almost every black person they celebrated was pretty much somebody who was validated by white America. Had they not been validated by white America, they would not have been on the documentary. You know, I saw, uh, and so these are smart people, but they were validated by white people. Without white people's support, they never would have gotten what they had. Uh, I saw Barack Obama. I think I saw Oprah Winfrey, uh, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods, you know, uh, and things like that. And then some civil rights icons, smart people, you know, like Maya Angelou and others. And, and I'm not saying that these are bad people at all. I'm just saying that if white people had not supported them if white folks had not put them on TV if white folks had decided to ban them these individuals would not be celebrated in the black community so a lot of what you consider to be black success is really the result of marketing it's a result of uh, white folks marketing a specific kind of person to you and making you feel like okay that's an icon that's somebody I that I admire you know so I, so I joke with Alicia I said I said yeah I said if I if I if I talk to if I convinced white people to give me a bunch of money and put me on TV I said yeah he'd probably be blowing my phone up too because that's what happens we tend to want to be close to people that we deem to be successful rich and powerful which is fine but and then and then he covers some big moments in Black history in, in a very you know accurate way. He talked about the L.A. riots, Hurricane Katrina, Million Man March, uh, the Bill Clinton the Bill Clinton years, and the mass incarceration that the Clinton administration pushed on Black people. Like he hit a lot of good issues, and I and I thought it was great. Um, but a lot of those issues also were these sort of very um, um, non essential issues when it comes to Black progress, power, and success. Uh, you know, there, like there's conversations about Clarence Thomas getting on the Supreme Court and how all that went down. And I'm not saying that that wasn't an issue. I'm not saying that Clarence Thomas is a great guy. But I saw I saw all these conversations. I saw conversations about about things like voting rights. You know, I saw uh, the presentation of Barack Obama without at any point questioning the fact that millions of black people, millions of black people feel that Barack Obama did not do a good job as, as, as a black president, that he did a good job as a symbolic leader that he was a great white president but for in terms of moving the needle on black the masses the on the position of the black masses there's no study no indicator you can show me that shows a clear adjustment in black life as a result of Obama being elected uh, you know so for example here's an example of what an adjustment would look like let's say Obama said we're going to deal with it. Not to say that he could have done this, right? Because and this is where the flaws of assimilation come into play. Obama was controlled by the system, right? Obama really wasn't a powerful man. He was only given power as long as white folks decided he would be powerful. They probably got things on him. They they probably you know they probably go and put a scandal on him in a second. It takes no, it's nothing to take. It's nothing to go back in a black man's life twenty years and find some girl that he slept with and that that's, that doesn't like him and get her to tell a story that will make him look like a rapist. Like so, they could probably pull things out on Obama. Remember, Obama's done things a lot of y'all have never done. Like Obama's used cocaine, right? He 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 admitted it this much. But usually, when somebody admits something this much, that means that that, that it's actually that much. They're admitting just enough so that it becomes a non-issue so that if you find out more it's like oh well we already talked about that we already talked about that right so just know you know I, with, 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 with him I get the sense that if you really went back into his life if you really wanted to take him down if you really wanted to do a Bill Cosby on him they probably could do that I, I really believe that they could and so 
uh, he's probably hamstrung on that. You know, but when you talk about moving the needle, what would have moved the needle? Well, you know, uh, FDR moved the needle for white folks when he put out the New Deal. FDR uh, went out and put out a massive stimulus package similar to what the government just did in response to the virus, where he literally allocated a chunk of government resources to getting the country out of a depression, right? So, uh, or you saw just now, our country committed three, four trillion dollars, some crazy amount of money to getting us out of this depression that we're in now, right? Well, you know, if you really care enough about what's going on with the masses of black people, you can do a stimulus package, like you can do a mar an urban Marshall Plan or an urban New Deal, where you allocate a trillion dollars to elevating you know black communities uh, across this country. Like it's not that hard to do, right? But but Obama never pushed for that. But but again, you know that is because he didn't really have the power to. I, I don't think he had the power to do it. And I think that it, it, and so it doesn't mean you blame him. But what it means is that it says, well, why are you elevating him as? this significant person in the community when there are people in the community that are directly linked to the community that are really trying to move the needle you know in a very strong and unapologetic sort of way and so so when i when i was watching the uh the documentary i i, I got to the point where i thought about it i try to sometimes when i experiment mentally to figure out what i'm really thinking about something i said you know i wonder if we did a documentary about jewish history in America. Like, if the Jews were talking about the great things they've accomplished in America, um, do the Jews have a long list of great basketball players and football players and singers and dancers and actors and actresses that they would be talking about, um, you know, for the entire, uh, you know, the entire time? Like, would they, would they, would they, would, would their greatest source of pride be, you know, the first time we had somebody Jewish elected to a high office? Uh, would, would they sort of be talking about individual success or would they actually talk more or as much about institutional success. You see, what elevates a community are not individuals. Most of your black celebrities, God bless them, they're, they're cool, they, I have no issues with these individuals, but most of them are pretty much high paid employees, right? So you think about the difference between a high paid employee versus somebody who runs a small business. A high paid employee you might think, oh, well, my cousin is a, a, you know, a general manager down at Ford. He can get me a job, right? Yeah, he could. Um, you know, but, you know, he's only going to be able to get you a job if his boss says it's okay. And if he brings you in, he can only bring in a couple of you. He can't bring in the masses. He can't say, I'm going to hire 10,000 black people. He can say, I'm going to hire one. Or I've got my Negro mentorship program, so I've got three black people in that program. Right. So what that does is that creates the, the black elite and it leaves the masses behind because there's no sort of institutional uh, institutional uh, movement behind any of that. Right. It's all about individual stuff. Right. Now, imagine if he had a, had a business, you know, let's say he had a business that was doing 10 million a year in revenue. Well, then he could say, you know, I'm going to go and hire as many black people as I can. So I'm going to hire dozens of people. Um, and I'm also and, and I get to make the final decision. And I'm also going to connect with other black business owners to do things in the community that will move the needle in terms of education and success of black people to encourage and incentivize them to come back into black communities. Right. So. So, you know, I think that the Jewish community, if the Jewish community was really talking about the great things they've done in this country, they might focus on, for example, the fact that they built Hollywood. Right. They built Hollywood, which was a multi trillion dollar industry that employs thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people in the Jewish community. I want you to tell me, tell me yes or no. Yes or no. Can you think of anything? Black people, we, we make up a much pr bigger percentage of the population than the Jewish community. We've been here longer than the Jewish community. Name one thing that we built that is even one fifth as big as Hollywood that employs one fifth as many people in our community as they employ in their own. Name one. I mean, we got every damn celebrity on the block. We got all kinds of Negroes on TV. We got all kinds of actors and actresses. And, and I think I saw Shonda Rhimes and I saw, you know, all these other individuals. And, um, you know, seriously, na name, 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 name one thing. Can, yes or no. Can you name anything that we have ever done as a collective, as a community that is on the, even anywhere near the scale? of Hollywood. And that's just one thing that the Jewish community has done, by the way. Uh, they've also done tre made tremendous strides in controlling um, media, 
uh, a lot of t TV networks and things like that are owned by the Jewish community, uh, newspapers, magazines, stuff like that, because they wanted to control the image of their people. And then uh, also they made tremendous strides in um, banking. They own a lot of banks. Okay, Tyler Perry Studios does not count because Tyler Perry showed you very clearly that when he writes a script, he plays all nine black women in that movie. Tyler Perry literally showed it. Did anybody remember that? When he showed a picture of his writer's room and he said he's the only one in his writer's room. So you, he, that means he, he'll write a script with nine black women in it and he'll play every single woman in the damn script. Like that's 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 that. Again, that gets back to that celebration of individualism, the celebration of, you know, that these sort of one offs. Right. The, this this symbolism. Symbolism does not elevate a community. Uh, institutional frameworks, institutional infrastructure moves the community. Uh, and so, so another thought. Now, by the way, somebody was asking if there's a scholarship to the master class. Um, if you are having financial hardship and you want to get in the master class, send an email to support at the black business school dot com and maybe they can work out a deal or support you in some way. Um, uh, that's support at the black business school dot com. Maybe they can give you, you know, they can, you know, you tell them about your situation. And uh, and we do have some stuff in place. So if you'd like to join the master class, and the master class, if you want to know more about it, it starts uh, May 6th. It's at Dr. Boyce Master Class dot com. That's Dr. Boyce Master Class dot com. Uh, yeah, so so basically you have uh, I like the word monarchy. Um, it's kind of like an aristocracy kind of thing. Right, you've kind of got this celebration of the black elite. Um, m most of the individuals that are considered part of the black elite are individuals that have been sanctioned by white America. Uh, why do I know that? Well, because if you look at where they get most of their money, they get their money from white people. If you look at where they get most of their power, they get their power from white people. If you look at where they get most of their visibility, they get most of their visibility from white people. Black people might love them, mind you. Like black people may watch the shows uh, because we too have been sort of uh, indoctrinated into the, these systems, right? So, so, so they, they'll market a black person, and then black people will love that person and say, "Oh my God, you're an icon. I love you. You're so brilliant." But remember, who's making the final decision? The final decision is not being made by you. I'll give you an example. Um, a different world. Um, actually, Daryl Daryl Bell from A Different World. He texted me yesterday. I got to text him back. I love Daryl Bell. Daryl Bell played Ron. He played Dwayne Wayne's best friend. Daryl is a smart brother. He's been on his channel. I love him very much. And one thing Daryl and I had a conversation about is I said, why don't they just bring it back? Like, like there's so many people out here that love a different world. Like, they would love, they would support it. They, they would love to see Whitley Gil, Whitley Gilbert, Dwayne, and they love to see Dwayne Wayne and and Freddie and New Generation and all this stuff. And basically, they can't bring it back. They can't bring it back because they don't own it. Warner Brothers owns a different world, you know. And Warner Brothers is like, mm, we want to bring back Roseanne, but we don't really want to bring back a different world. So, and, and we don't want you to bring it back either. So we're gonna just sit it on the shelf, and and also oh and by the way fuck you that's a, oh that's another yeah yeah so so by the way screw all you all you black people because you have no power and you don't know how to get power so until you get power we're just pretty much gonna do whatever we want right and so um so let me let me lay out a couple of more things in terms of the documentary I I watched the documentary I again this is no disrespect to Henry Louis Gates or the individuals that were on the documentary, I think that there is an argument to at least be aware of some of the white sanctioned black history that's out there, right? White folks, you know, they'll sell you all day on the civil rights movement. Uh, white folks will sell you all day on the Barack Obama presidency as being the pinnacle of black achievement, which it is not, by the way. Barack Obama was a guy who was able to get white people to vote for him. That's what makes him brilliant. That's what makes him wonderful. That's what makes him great. And I'm very happy for him for that. But that is not the pinnacle of black achievement uh, because black people as a collective did not move forward as a result of that. The Obamas became worth you know, half a billion dollars as a result, and that's very good for them. But this was not a significant achievement for black people. You must stop confusing achievement with assimilation. Stop, uh, you know, and, and I want you to do this, right? When you see somebody and they say, oh my God, this black person accomplished so much, I want you to ask yourself, I want you to say, what did they accomplish exactly? Okay, so they played a sport, and, they, and white people put them on TV. Okay, that's an accomplishment, that they're good at their sport, and that's really cool, but who's making the final decision? Right. If 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 white if, if the white man in the back of the room decides to blackball that person, you'll never see them again. Right. Or if they if an actor comes along and they say, "Oh my God, that's the most accomplished actor." It, why are they accomplished? Oh, they got an Academy or they got an Oscar. 
well, wait, white people created Oscars. They invented Oscars. I read the history of that. We read in, in the Black Business School, we read this book called um, how, the, how the Jews Invented Hollywood. They pretty much made the Oscars up. They created the Oscars as a way to keep from having to pay their actors and actresses more money. They were like, God, we got to give them something. Like, let's massage their asses and make them feel better about themselves. Let's create these bullshit awards and hand them out and then they'll you know it'll feed their ego so we'd rather feed your ego than feed your bank account and that's where the oscars came from okay so 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 you really kind of have to look at it because i was watching and, uh, and he was talking about these esteemed accomplished black people and he would show them getting some award that was invented by white people and i would say i'd be, I'd be like wow you really have made white people into your gods uh you've made them into like almost like your uh uh, your federal government, you've made them into your dungeon masters, so to speak, your your wizards. It's like you've made yourself an actor in a play where the white man wrote the script, right? You've made yourself an actor in a play where a white man wrote the script. And the thing about that, the danger of that, is that if you are an actor in a play where somebody else writes the script, they can write your ass out of the script anytime that they want. They can decide, look, we're going to make sure you're sleeping with the fishes next season and you're gone, right? There have been many, many so-called black icons that disappeared from existence, disappeared because white folks decided, you know, we don't like this guy anymore. He, You know, what he's doing is too black, it's too radical, it's, it's getting on our nerves, we, we, we're going to get rid of him. Uh, and there are great black people who've never entered into the broader black public consciousness because white folks uh, cannot digest what they're doing and it's okay like I think that's good I think those are the individuals those are the people that I look for those are the ones like like my question is not um, okay you know, I am I will never believe that you achieve greater freedom by receiving greater acceptance I think that you're free when you don't care if anybody accepts you that's when a black person is truly free in my opinion I I, I didn't become free when I was trying to you know get a job you know like like I, I was in academia I, I you know I was at Syracuse and you know I was trying to get these these jobs and all this and bend you know twist and bend and play the game and and then but I didn't really become Superman so to speak in terms of being really who I am until I just really broke the chains off and said I'm just gonna be me man like I'm pretty good at being me I'm not good at being a white man I can't I can't be I can't you know I'm never gonna be the best at being a white guy because white guys already got that on lock they're already they, that's the original I'm just a cheap imitation so I'm gonna go off and be me whatever that means to me whatever that means to the world and I'm gonna find people who can appreciate that right um you know and so so I so I think so you so pay attention right this, this is one critique you can lay on the Henry Louis Gates of the world in terms of looking at what they're doing it looks great it looks beautiful it makes you feel good right when I was watching all these iconic you know these moments in black history that have have been you know put on TV by white people um, you know and these people that we all know that from because we've seen their TV shows or their sporting events it was fun to watch it was really interesting to watch but then I thought about it and two things hit me one was I said we have this all this so-called black achievement that's being presented on this fucking screen and the needle has not moved in our community hardly at all. In fact, we've moved backward, right? Since integration, it's we've actually moved backwards in a lot of key indicators when it comes to quality of life. Uh, we certainly have less power than we had before because everybody's chasing this assimilation dream, and it ain't, it can only work for a few of you. If a hundred of you try to do it, it might work for ten. The other ninety of you are going to be left out in the cold, and that's the problem with assimilation, right? And even the ten of you that think you made it. You actually got what in economics we refer to this as the winner's curse. The winner's curse is when you think you won, but really you lost. Like you think you're free, but really you became a bigger slave. So a lot of your so-called really successful black people are really just sort of, you know, high paid, high profile employees. Uh, a high paid, high profile employee does not have the ability in most cases to institute significant systematic change that's going to impact dozens or thousands and thousands of people. Seriously, they, they don't. You know, they, there's no scaling of a job there's just not you know like you know even if you talk about the best your favorite actor your favorite uh, you know singer your favorite basketball player nine times out of ten there's no scaling of that right that individual and their family are going to do extremely well they might mentor two or three people and that's really great 
my mom had a really hard conversation, you know, with, with some guys I just have a lot of respect for and appreciate over at the, the Jordan brand. I, I went over there and I, I went to Oregon and they showed me around and I just respect them so much. But I remember saying, I said, you know, I, I think that there's, I, I said, so what are you doing, you know, for the masses of these brothers, you know, these, these young kids that are sitting in the hood with nothing to do, you know. And, uh, and he mentioned that they have a mentorship program where they bring in two or three of them and let them do internships at Nike. And I said, that's three people. Like, that's not going to move the needle in the black. Three people ain't never moved the needle for shit in any community in the history of this planet. Three people, I mean, no disrespect to that at all. But I think that we are trained on the wrong models. A lot of you have done that. A lot of you maybe got that job where you were the only black person and you felt like you were moving the needle because you mentored two Negroes a year. Or maybe you got a job, you know, in my field, in academia. You, you know, I'd see black people that would get a job at a white university and say, I really want to make a difference. So they would mentor like one black student every year, maybe two, maybe three, maybe five. That's not scaled up systematic modification of 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 the of the um of the plight of a community that's not gonna really make a difference on a broad scale right so i think that it doesn't mean everybody has to do it right everybody can't go to that level but i think that one one of the problems with a henry lewis gates documentary is that you're missing the celebration as you're celebrating the negro on tv you should also be celebrating the black people in the community that are that have achieved some ability to scale their impact to the point where it's it's impacting at least dozens, maybe hundreds of people. So, for example, um, you know, as you talk about Shonda Rhimes getting her deal with Netflix, good for her writing Grey's Anatomy and Scandal and these other shows that white people love. Um, you know, why not also talk about Jay Morrison and the Tulsa Fund? Jay Morrison, again, you, you critique him all you want. You know, I'm sure maybe there's something to critique. I'm not here to, I'm not here vouching to say anybody's perfect. But shit, you tell me, you show me any Negro that was on that screen that can say I got thousands of black people together to build one of the largest investment funds in the history of our people in the history of our community. That's some epic shit. That's some transformative high level shit it's it's it, it's a scalable model right if lebron did it if you know it, or if, if if a michael jordan did it and had the consciousness to even care enough to try to do it it could be a hundred times bigger you know or maybe if you took a jay morrison and you gave him the same respect that you give a negro who can dunk a goddamn basketball maybe you he could do that maybe jay could then go and Take that thing and have a hundred thousand black folks in an investment fund that reaches a billion, ten billion dollars, right? Where you can go in and make transformative modifications in a black community. Like you can go to a city like Baltimore, which I don't give a shit what anybody says. Elijah Cummins, or rest, you know, rest, rest, rest in peace. But, but you know, I'm sorry when they had that whole debate of whether Baltimore is a shithole. I know a lot. I've, I've been to Baltimore, and there are parts of it that are as beautiful as any place you've ever been. But there are some parts of Baltimore that are shitholes shitholes right and, and and they ain't gonna change they're always gonna be shitholes as long as you think that some democratic congressman is gonna make a difference they ain't changing shit they're not changing a damn thing what's gonna change it is if you have something like a, a, a Tulsa fund using that as an example that comes in with a billion dollars in black owned capital and capital that has the double bottom line of seeing uh, you know a profit come in but also seeing black people win that's what's going to allow them to go into these really struggling parts of, of urban communities and really improve them in a significant way because your heart has to be in the right place. A white man's capitalism will never fix a black man's suffering. Let me say that again. White man's capitalism will never fix the black man's suffering or the black woman's suffering or the black family's suffering. That, that's not ever going to work. So, so, so you know, I, I think, so, so when you talk about this documentary, this is the bone I would have to pick with a Henry Louis Gates. And then, but then again, I'm not picking a bone with him because that's his documentary. He can do whatever he wants. God bless him. You know, he, he got this white people thing down. The people at Harvard love him. Uh, you know, the PBS people love him. And I think it's good for him. And he has a right to talk about whatever he wants. But I want to talk to those individuals who want to understand what the solution looks like and just know that this ain't the solution. We can make documentaries like this for the next thousand years. And 
you're not going to see the community move forward as a result of this. All you see are these feel-good injections. It's like heroin being injected in your arm that makes you feel good because you see these iconic people that you love so much. Like, oh, look at the Obamas. It, oh, they, I just love their family. Oh, my God, those kids are so cute. Oh, my God, Sasha's so smart. Look at, oh, my God. Oh, they, oh I, and I remember when he got elected. That made me feel so good. Like, you're really, like, you're sitting there and you're, 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 you're self-medicating. You're self-medicating from your suffering by watching, you know, all these iconic moments and these feel-good scenarios that make you feel better about the misery that your community is going through, right? Uh, you know, the, but but also like the drug addict, once the high comes down, you go you got to go back to reality. Uh, so so you know some other individuals that are um, notably missing from documentaries like this are people like Dr. Claude Anderson. Dr. Claude Anderson wrote the Powernomics. Uh, if you don't know about Dr. Claude Anderson, then you don't know anything about Black history. The idea that Dr. Claude Anderson can write a book like Powernomics taught, that's, that's really insanely committed to the black community, that is uh, deeply committed to uh, a structured, systemic, collective effort by black people to achieve real power in America. The fact that a man could write something like that and be ignored in favor of some Negro who was on a TV show tells you where your head is at. It tells you you're losing because you're not even paying attention to the real solutions that exist out here. I mean, how can it doesn't mean he has to get all the attention. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just sitting there. You tell me, how is it that you can celebrate, you know, Oprah and Tiger Woods and Barack Obama or whatever, you know, or, or Shonda Rhimes, but you ain't got nothing to say about a man who wrote a book that that puts his name on the level of a Marcus Garvey in terms of laying out a vision for, for black power that is on a very, very high level. You know, we got to get on the same page with this. Uh, or, or if you talk about, again, going back to systemic infrastructure, again, the Jewish community, if they do a documentary about the success of the Jewish people, they're not going to put a bunch of actors and singers and, and, and basketball players on the documentary. They're going to talk about their institutions. They're going to talk about the things they did collectively as a community that moved the needle for the whole community. So, uh, again, if you're talking about things that are really moving the needle for black people, why why are these elite Negroes completely unaware of things like We Buy Black, where Sharif Abdul Malik, uh, literally as a young student coming out of Howard who really learned business, a lot you got a lot of business school students at Howard but they don't know nothing about building a business. A lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them don't because they don't teach that at Howard. They don't teach that at a lot of business schools. He went to Howard University. He was a social work major, and uh, but he was taught to build a business. And he built a business called We Buy Black. And the business is scaled at a very high level where he's brought together hundreds of thousands, if not millions of black people who are all basically you know, corralling the economic power of the black dollar and targeting that money like a laser right back into the black community. If you're part of the black elite and you're trying to be part of the solution, you should be elevating those initiatives and not apologizing for it. Right? We must at least as people learn the difference between symbolism and actual functional modification, functional adjustments. Again, the, the, the scaling process, you know, so for example, we were talking about Kanye West being a billionaire. Kanye, again, Kanye is in that category. You know, he's celebrated because, you know, a bunch of people gave him a record deal. He goes and raps for white people and he makes a lot of money from that. Um, and he loves to brag about himself. And I don't even fault him for that. You can be as arrogant as you want. I don't care about that stuff. But it's okay. I don't give a shit if you're a billionaire, if you can't show me, a, you know, 300 black people that are working for you, you know, or I think, I think the number was... I think I, said, I think I said for every million dollars a year you make, there should be five black people that, that say that they are paying their bills because of you. So that means that if you made $100 million last year, uh, that should be 500 black people in the hood that can say, um, you know, I pay my bills. Like I, I made, you know, 50000 or 60000 or whatever because I work for, for Mr. West and I work for his organization, right? Um, you know, the fact that he has a high paying job that puts money into his pocket and takes care of his, you know, his his wife and sister-in-laws with the, with their fake booties or whatever. Like that doesn't do anything for me. That means nothing to me as a black person when you're talking about 
what it's really going to take to move the needle. Now, maybe Kanye has stuff in mind. Maybe he has a grand vision. Maybe he's not aware. Maybe he hasn't thought about this, right? A lot of us don't think about these things because we're never introduced to these ideas. We're never challenged on this front. But, um, you know, I, I think you got to look at system, system systematizing. You got to look at scale. Uh, that's what's going to be the solution. So uh, I'll give you an example in terms of what I do. Uh, I'm not perfect. I, I am not. I, I'm trying to get better at this every day. Uh, but think about this. I'm sitting here talking to you right now. And I'm talking to thousands of you. So thousands of people who watch this video are going to benefit from whatever's in my brain. Right? Now, I could just as easily have stayed at Syracuse University and be talking to 30 kids in the classroom. That's what I used to do, you know, or, and, and have two black people in there, you know, the ones who can afford to pay $70,000 a year to go to Syracuse. I could have I could have had, you know, big success on a very small scale. Right? A lot of us are uh, extraordinary in a very tiny way. Um, and I said, no, I, I, if I'm going to be extraordinary, I want to be extraordinary in a very big way. How do I find some way without asking for the white man's permission to reach hundreds and hundreds of thousands of black people? How do we scale this damn thing? You know, I, I put all this time into getting this Ph.D. and learning all this stuff. How do I scale it? How do I how do I have systematic infrastructural processes that allow us to um, really, really move the needle on on black families? Right. And uh, and as a result, you know, I get messages all the time from a lot of you telling me how you're you're educating your kids different or your kids. Your, some of y'all got eight year olds who know finance at a very advanced level. Right. And I'm very proud to say that I was a part of that process. Right. Um, and, and so so just, you know, think outside the box. Um, let's let go of this symbolism. Uh, let's let go of this, you know, celebration of 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 high paid employees. Uh, you know, or, or you know, because that, 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 that's not, you know, some actor on TV really means nothing to black people. Like it, it, it makes you feel good psychologically. But if you take that away, they re there's really nothing there in terms of actual substance, in terms of really moving the masses forward. And uh, and, and that honestly, when I thought about it, because I couldn't understand it, I said, we got all these damn black millionaires and all these black people on TV and doing great things and in sports and everything else. Why is the community sitting still? Like, why haven't we made progress? Why do we have these cities that are shitholes? And and I believe it's an overcommitment to these damn Democrats. Like, you know, seriously, like sitting around, you know, when I was listening to Obama, he got to the point where he he had Obama talking about voting rights. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense that Democrats would be talking about voting rights because they want to get Negroes to the polls. That's what they got to do. They got to like, damn, we can't win if we don't get black people to the polls. So the only thing they'll fight for Think about this. They will never fight for your reparations as hard as they fight for your damn voting rights. They will never fight for you to get small business loans as hard as they fight for you to have the right to show up and vote for some white man to get back into office. Seriously, I mean, you got to think about that. You got to be smart and, and kind of look at what the incentive is. These people don't love you, and it's up to you to really love yourself. And, uh, and, I, and I really think that in our community, we have some people that are really doing the damn thing, that are really changing things on a systematic level. Um, a lot of times when I'm talking to you guys, I gave up trying to get on TV because I said, okay, the white man's blocking me on that. He doesn't want me on TV because he doesn't want a message like mine transmitted to millions of black people. Uh, and then, you know, in, in, in a Henry Louis Gates, a guy like that, I'm not going to get along with him. Like, he's not going to, he's going to see me as too radical or maybe because I'm questioning certain things, he's not going to appreciate that. He's going to feel threatened by that. Uh, but then I thought about it and I said, uh, you know, and, and then you think about the school system. You know, the school systems, uh, again, this shows how little they actually love black children. There are black children who would benefit tremendously from hearing on a regular basis from people like, I don't know, Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan. But do you think Louis Farrakhan could get into most public schools across this country? No. He couldn't because they feel that they have the right to control what messages you receive. Black people love Louis Farrakhan. White people hate him. So because white people hate him, it doesn't matter that black people love him. He's not going to get invited to your son's public school. So the Internet beautifully allows opportunities for us to, you know, sort of circumvent or to, to just go around the system. Right. So when I'm talking to you every day and I'm trying and I'm convincing you, for example, on the power of black economics as one of the key solutions to empowerment, um, that's all. That's my power play. My power play is I know what I can do. I can go straight to the mother and the father and I can get the mother and the father to realize that 
your home is your first institution. Your home is, that's your university. That is your first small business. That is, that's your kingdom. That's your castle. So I'm speaking to you as the king or the queen of your castle to say, let me throw some ideas at you. And I hope that you'll consider passing this on to your children so that your family can achieve empowerment. Because I can tell you this, one thing about America that's really interesting is that when you have a black family that learns how to, um, First of all, love each other and be functional. We talked about that, right? We talked about just not engaging in the negativity and not fighting each other and learning how to love each other, support each other, and see the power in each other. But then also, they get access to a few resources because they've learned how to create their own opportunities and create their own wealth. Uh, and also even create, maybe maybe if, if, you're, if you get really good, you can create jobs for other people. Then that person is immune from a big chunk of the racism that's out here. It doesn't mean that it's not doesn't exist. I mean, there's stuff out there, right? You, you still have some political issues, right? You still have issues with police and things like that. But even in Poweronomics, Dr. Claude Anderson basically says that if, you, if your community has enough empowered families and they have enough wealth, they can control the police department. They can go down to the mayor's office and, and, and the city council meetings and, and change the politics of the community. Because most of your politics are controlled by money. Most of the politics are controlled by the people that have, have resources. So a lot of poor black people get ignored because they're poor and they're black. That's what. That's why poor black people. You know. That's why they don't feel they really owe those individuals anything. And so, and, and so, I, I kind of get a little bit tired and bored with the same political conversations. Like, oh yeah, so such and such Democrat is running for office. We got to vote, y'all. We got to get out and rock the vote, y'all. I feel like I'm living in that Bill Bill Murray movie Groundhog Day because I feel like I see it every four years or every two years, really. I see it over and over and over again. And these individuals are very complacent with sitting still. Like, they're very comfortable with complacency. Like, they're very happy with, like, like literally, you can look at the black community now and go back 25 years, and you got the same damn shit. Like, like nothing's really moved forward. And I'm just kind of like, well, this ain't fun. Uh-oh. Somebody said no sound. Uh-oh. Can you guys hear me? You guys can't hear me anymore? Okay, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and shut this down then. Um, and I'll, um, I'll just have to come back. I apologize, guys. Sorry. Um, let me see. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me see. They, they're saying I muted myself, but I don't think it's, it's going to work. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I'll see you guys soon. So, uh, I know you guys can hear me on Instagram, but they, they lost me on YouTube. So I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. So I'll put the recording up on the platform so you guys can see it later. All right. So, um, so, so anyway, and I, I've been talking for a while. So thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. And, um, and I hope that this conversation helped you a little bit. It looks like my computer froze. I'm looking at it now and it completely. Here we are, clan, the isms, cataclysm, great. Our people out here struggling, trying to make it in this state. Everybody out here doing it, but we the ones who late. Now, family, we the ones who gotta delegate. Get that money in the power, never be fake. Stick to co sign for three. What did he say? Uh, create jobs, support our own. Educate the same and buy back your home. Got three degrees, triple ten. Three PhDs, now we on the CNN. DBTV, let's talk about negligence. Ignorance is bliss, but we can turn it to intelligence. Believe none of what you hear, half of what you see. Let's break it down here on Dr. Boyce TV.